So let me show you my screen. Okay, where have we stopped last class? Have we done have we done a already autocorrelation? Someone? Guys, have we, have we started to do autocorrelation? Uh, yes, we just started a little bit. We were looking at the different graphs of the arrow. Uh, Durbin Watson, we did Durbin Watson. Uh, the the uh, graphs. Oh, uh, okay, got it, got yeah. it. Yeah, perfect. So let's let's continue talking, guys, about autocorrelation. Autocorrelation. So basically, the the, the model requires no autocorrelation. Okay, so the the Euler's model wants that the covariance of error at time i versus error at time j to be equal to zero for all i different to j. Okay, so. And we said uh, there is a, if we have a, a model, let's assume this is my yt equals, I will call this beta zero plus beta one x one t plus beta two x two t plus my error time t. Okay, so this is going to be my generic model. Uh, and, and then what, what we do is, what we talk about autocorrelation is basically, we want to talk first about first order autocorrelation. And the first order autocorrelation means simply that what we are going to do is we're going to estimate the errors. And then we are going to see if these errors are autocorrelated of order one. Okay, so this is another error. This is an IID error. Basically, what we try to see is there a dependence between the path of the errors, the past one, one period, one period back with a current error. Okay, so this is what we're going to try to see. The, the null hypothesis, guys, is this is a regression. Do you see? It's a regular regression. So my null hypothesis is going to be that row equals zero. So in words, this means no autocorrelation of order one. Agree with me? So statistically not significant implies that there is no autocorrelation of order one. The test that does this one here, guys, is called the Durbin Watson. That's the name of the test that works with this one here. It's going to be the Durbin Watson. Okay. And the Durbin Watson, guys, is simply equal to two times one minus the correlation of the errors. Okay, so this is your Durbin Watson test. And let's let's explore the meaning of that. So obviously, guys, we can have different possible values for a Durbin Watson. In general, if we have a, a perfect positive autocorrelation, so when rho equals one, so this implies that Durbin Watson is going to be what? So this is one, one minus one is zero. So Durbin Watson is going to be zero, right? So if you have a Durbin Watson equal to zero, so this implies that your variables are, your errors are, have a first order of correlation that is extremely strong, very close to one. Now, if there is no autocorrelation, so if rho equals zero, so this implies that my Durbin Watson is going to be equal to two, two. Right? And that, that, this is the number that we're going to be looking at, is a number close to two, right? And of course, if we have a, a negative, a perfect negative autocorrelation of equal minus one, so your Durbin Watson is going to be equal to, uh, is going to be equal to four. Make sense to everyone? Yeah. Perfect. So let me open. I send you today a couple of, oh. Thanks, one second.
Makes sense. So guys, in order to find no autocorrelation of first order, you are going to be looking at around a Dublin Watson close to, to two. Okay? However, guys, the Dublin Watson has a has an issue. The Dublin Watson is not like a T distribution or T test or, or normal or F test. It has three different values. You know, and there are two regions. So this is my zero, this is my two. And this is my, my four. So this one here implies perfect positive autocorrelation. This one here represents perfect negative autocorrelation. This one here implies no autocorrelation. And then we have two values here. So this is going to be the Dublin Watson low, Dublin Watson up, Dublin Watson low. So this is going to be, sorry, four minus uh, Dublin Watson up. And this one here is going to be four minus Dublin Watson low. I will explain you in a minute how this works. Okay. So the issue is that all this part here is negative correlation. So if you find values that the test goes in this value, so you're going to have negative correlation, uh, sorry, positive correlation. All this part here is going to be no autocorrelation. And this part here, so perfect negative autocorrelation is this one here, perfect, perfect negative or positive autocorrelation is this one here. All this part here, guys, all this interval here is negative autocorrelation. Okay. You see that there are two pieces of, of this line, this one here, and this one here, that we have no clue if there is a autocorrelation of first order. We don't know. Okay. So how this works? So the, the, the Durbin-Watson guys requires the number of observations and requires the number of a number of regressors without including a constant. So this is number of parameters, not including the constant. Okay, so if I'm assuming this model here, guys, how many parameters do I have? I will have two parameters, right? In my example here. You agree with me, guys? So in this one here, in this one here, k equals two. And, and let's assume that n is, um, I don't know, perhaps 40, 40 observations. Let me just create in any example. So how do we create this table here? Well, let me show you. Let me show you. I send you this file to you. So what we do is we find the number of regressors here. Do you see my, my screen? Guys, do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. OK, perfect. So the first thing you need to realize is the number of observations. So I told you we have 40 observations. So here we go, 40. And how many uh, uh, parameters do I have? I have two. So I'm going to be in this region here, the 1.391. So let me take a picture so I can, I can copy this in your side. Okay, so everyone is, is with me. So what I do is I simply count the number of observations, 40. How many parameters do I have? I have two. So my, my DL, my lower value is going to be 1.391 and my upper value is going to be 1.600. Okay, and th those are the values that I will use in my, in my graph here. So this means the following. So the critical values for, for this one here, so this is an example, okay? Number of, this is an example. So if I do now my, my line, just to find the critical values, I know that this is four, I know that this is two, I know that this is zero. So D, DL was equal to 1.391. This was 1.6. 
this number here is going to be 1.391, sorry, four minus, uh, my comma mistake, four minus 1.6. And this is going to be four minus 1.391. So this is going to be 2.4. And the other one is going to be, let me see, it's going to be four minus 1.3. Nine one is going to be two point two point six oh nine. Right? So imagine guys as an example. Let's assume that you go to your program and the Durbin Watson equals two point zero five. So what can you tell me about the the, the null hypothesis of no autocorrelation of order one? Right. Inconclusive. Oh. Are you sure? So remember that the, the inconclusive are these parts here, this one here, and this one here. We don't know. No autocorrelation. Exactly. So because we are in this part here, so all up to here, is we can argue that there is no autocorrelation. Of order one. Please be sure that the Durbin Watson order one. The Durbin Watson only guys measures autocorrelation of order one. So it's only one lag. Okay. We are going to see another more generic test in, in, in a couple of minutes. So oh sorry, this is my, my Durbin Watson. All this part here. Now let's take a look to how this looks in, in EDUS. Okay, can you copy? Are you with me? I still see the whiteboard. Yes, uh, no, no, you, you okay here? You understand? Yes. Okay, perfect. So now let's go to the eViews. If you can open this file, guys, I will, I will show you which eViews. I sent you yesterday a file that is called uh, MDA Exxon Results, Results is Spanish Results. Can you open that uh, if you file, please? I sent this yesterday, I think. What was your file name again, Professor? It's MVA, it's, it's here, MVA Exxon Results. We have it, guys. Yeah, I have it pulled up. Yeah, perfect. Uh, one minute to everyone to, to be with me here, guys, because we're going to be working with this. Okay, so everyone is with me. Are you with me, guys? We need to move. Yes, Professor. 
Okay, perfect. So what I've done here, guys, I've developed all the models already. So I, you know how to do that. So just click on MVV, NVA, sorry. And if you want to see what is the regression here, you just go estimate, and this is my, my regression. So it is a returns of Exxon Mobil minus the DTV. So this is my risk premium equals a constant. My returns of the DJ, DJ industrial is my, my market minus DTV. And then I'm including CPI. So this is infl inflation. I'm including uh, what is PCE. I don't remember what is PCE is, price consumption, something, and oil, okay? So what I'm saying is basically that we believe is that our, uh, the, the Exxon prices depend on the market. This is a, an APT model again. Depends on inflation. The higher the inflation, what you expect is that the price of oil is going to be, the price of Exxon is going to be higher because the, the prices of oil increase. Also, the price of oil increases, uh, Exxon goes up. That, so if you run the simple OLS model, LS, this is square. We, we run this stuff here. And then these are my results. Are you with me? Now, when we talk about the uh, autocorrelation of order one, so this is the one that we're looking for, 2.2189, Durbin Watson. Do you see that? Okay, do you see my, my screen? Do you know that Durbin Watson 2.21? Okay, so if we base our results on, of course, this needs to be changed. This needs to be changed, but 2.80, sorry, 2. Point, what was the value? 2.21. Yeah, 2.21 is really very close to this part here. Do you agree? So we can argue guys that there is no autocorrelation of order one. Right? Now, to do this properly, guys, we don't have time. Indeed, N, you need to look for N. Uh, N goes to 100. So if it's larger than 100, you simply select 100. How many coefficients do we have in my, in my model? How many coefficients do we have here, not including the, the constant? Four, one, two, three, four. Got it? So I have 313 observations. So indeed, my table, the one that I will use is going to be, 100 and four observations and four variables. So you simply select this value, 100, one, two, three, and four. So these numbers here, 1.592 and 1.758 are, are the numbers that you need to plug into your, into your table, right? Into your graph and then you find the critical values. Make sense? Guys, make sense? Okay, yeah. perfect. Excellent. So let's go now. Let's continue then. So this is autocorrelation for the one. Now, but indeed in real life, the autocorrelation of the errors not only need to be order one, it can be with a second lag, with a third lag, with a fourth lag, etc. Okay, so we want a model that allows us to determine if we have autocorrelation of a, of more lags than one. Got it? And that's what we're going to be doing in, in a couple of minutes. So let me save this one and let's go to another one. The, the test, guys, that is going to allow us, allow us to do that is called the Bruce Gottfried. Okay, so this Bruce Gottfried, guys, allows us to, to test autocorrelation of order R, okay? Any number it can be autocorrelation or, of order five, 12 or whatever you can imagine. So what is the, the null hypothesis? Okay, let's go again to my model. Okay, so assume that I have this model. I'm running this model. Very simple model. Plus my errors. What I do is I compute my, my, my regression. I compute this regression. I get my errors. And then what I do is I simply run a regression of these errors with a constant plus gamma one error t minus one plus gamma two error t minus two plus plus gamma r error t minus r plus 
another error that is an IID. Okay? So what is going to be my null hypothesis, guys? Well, my null hypothesis is basically the gamma one equals zero, gamma two equals zero, etc. Gamma r equals zero. Do you agree? So what is that, the, the null hypothesis in words? If gamma one, gamma two, gamma r are zero, so this implies that the, the, my error is simply equal to a constant, correct? So there is no autocorrelation of order r. So in words, that the Bruch Godfrey test implies no autocorrelation. Of order, I'm sorry, r. R is a number, order five, order whatever you can imagine. Okay, now my test is going to be simply T minus R because I, I have a T observations minus R because I'm losing R observations times R square, the R square that you get from your result. And this is going to be distributed as a chi square with R degrees of freedom. Okay, one example. So let's assume that I have 313 observations. Let's assume that I want to do five lakhs. So I want to have, I want to see if there is an, the, uh, if errors minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, and minus five have an influence on my current error. All right, so autocorrelation of order five. Uh, Okay, so with these two ones, what I want is I want to see my null hypothesis. Is there autocorrelation of order five of my errors? So that's what I'm going to try to test. Right? So in general, guys, this is going to be, how do I find that test? It's going to be T. So it's going to be 313 minus five. And imagine, okay, that my R square is equal to 0 0.75, just assume. So this is going to be 313 minus five times my 0 0.75. And I say that this one here is going to be distributed as a chi square with five degrees of freedom. Right? So you have a number here, you have a chi square. The chi square looks like that, it looks like the F distribution. Okay, so you have your 5%, they say alpha equals 0.5%. You go to the table, you find the critical value. And then you compare, this number falls in here. So this is non-reject. And from here to here is reject. And then you simply compare. If this value here falls in the reject rejection zone, so you are rejecting no autocorrelation. So this implies that you have autocorrelation, All right? Now, of course, you can use this, this um, this hypothesis testing, but also you can use the p-value rule. What is the p-value rule, guys? If the p-value is smaller than alpha, the significance level. So what is my conclusion? Reject or not reject? Fail to reject. Okay. Reject. Of course, guys, if p-value is more than alpha implies that, uh, implies that my, my p-value, the probability of my test is going to be smaller than this black area here. Agree? So the rule is always, that the rule never changes. And the beauty of the p-value guys is that indeed you don't need to, to find, you need to find this part here. You need to find a critical value and then replace the value. You simply use the p-value and then you are, you are okay with that. Questions? Otherwise we go to, to reviews. Um, professor, just just out of curiosity, R square is always going to be given to us, right? Oh no, no, you want to have? I, I will show you in a minute. Yes, of course. If I if I if I give you an exam I, or a question, yes, I need to give you the R square. There is no way you can you can do this without this information. Okay. So now let's go and, and let's take a look to our to our reviews. Let's continue with our reviews. So just be sure, guys, that you run this again. You have your regression run. The, the same that we have before, the one that is called MB, MBA.
Are you with me? So you can follow me. Then we go view. Then we go residual test. And then you go serial correlation LM test. So you go view, residual diagnosis, serial correlation LM test. Just click there. And then here is the, the number of lags. Do you remember I, I said five? Now, why do I have five? Indeed, guys, how do we select the, the number of lags? It depends on the data that you have. So imagine if you have a daily data, normally what you believe is that five days, you know, five lags is enough, right? If you have a monthly data, the people use 12 lags. So we believe that, the, you know, one year in back can influence our current residuals. And if I have quarterly data, I use four, four lags, et cetera. Make sense? So it's more intuition and more practical issues. So as soon as I have here, I think daily data, I will just add five. Okay, then I simply run my, my model. What is the null hypothesis, guys, when we have the Bruce Godfrey serial correlation? <clears throat> as soon as I have five lags, what I'm saying is that <clears throat> what I'm saying is that there is no autocorrelation of order five. So that's my, my null hypothesis. There is no autocorrelation of order five. Taking a look to these ones here, guys. Remember which one when we have 313 observations, so my sample size is very decent, it's large. Which one do you prefer? Which one captures better the, the impact of small samples? The F or the chi square? The F does small samples. Exactly. The F distribution, guys, is does a much better work when you have the small samples. Okay. In this case, you're kind of indifferent. You can see that they are very similar to each other. Now, guys, what can you conclude? At a 5% significance level, do you reject or not reject the null hypothesis of no autocorrelation of 4 or 5? Reject. Yeah, we are in the borderline. Do you agree? If, according to the F, we are we're at slightly above. According to the, to the chi-square, we are slightly below the 0 0.05. Okay? Safe, it is safer, guys, to assume that we reject the null hypothesis. Okay? You understand what I'm telling to you? So it is better. When you're in the borderline, you normally go in the pessimistic side of the equation. So you reject the null hypothesis. Okay? So if we reject the null hypothesis in this case, what, what we are saying is that the, the hypothesis of no autocorrelation of order five is rejected. It's, sorry, it's not rejected, correct? Fail to reject or, or reject? Reject. Okay? So this implies that we have autocorrelation problems with of order five here. Agree with me? Okay, so what do we do? Before going there, let me let me share my screen again, my my problems here. So let's let's go. Uh, first of all, what causes autocorrelation? Okay, one of the main problems, guys, with autocorrelation is seasonality. Okay, so if we have, for example, the ice cream sales, do you know that ice cream sales go very dramatically down in winter, then goes up in the summer is a peak, and then goes down again and goes up again. So this is seasonality, right? So if you don't con capture seasonality, seasonality correctly, so your model is going to be autocorrelated by definition. Okay, so how do you solve that? Well, just solve the problem with uh, seasonality. We're gonna do this later, okay? So if we have seasonality and we know that by the data we have seasonality, it's very simple to solve seasonality. We're gonna do that later. Now, the second one, the second problem guys is omitted variables. So perhaps your specification has forgot one variable that is important. Right? And, and, and this one here is very tricky, do you know? Because unless you have a theory, a very, you know, very strong theoretical foundation that you know which variables should be included, otherwise you are simply guessing. And you perhaps sometimes you don't you don't imagine what variables are important to explain your, your y variable. Okay, so this one here is very tricky, but I will show you the, the impact of what happens when you we have this issue. And finally, guys, 
is uh, that we have a specified a model with wrong dynamics. So how do we solve this, this number three? Okay. Number one, we're gonna do number one later. Omitted variable, we're going to, to learn how to identify that. And run dynamics, let's do run dynamics at, at this point. So run dynamics, guys, my model at this point is TT. So what I mean is the following. I have this model. Plus my error, do you agree? So that's the model I have. So everything is contemporaneous. It's T, T, and T. However, one potential solution is simply say, you know what, perhaps it's not only the, the current variable T, the current variable time T that influences or explains my YT. It's simply perhaps the, the lack of these ones that explain this one here. So perhaps I can have a model like this. So I'm lagging one. So do you understand what I've done? So I have included simply the lags of my X. This model here is called distributed lag model. Okay, so this is one additional model that can capture the dynamics of your data. But also you can argue, you know what, hey, perhaps it's not a, the, the lack of the exogenous variables, but the lack of my YT. So, and, and this is uh, more or less the, the environment of a time series that we're going to start looking next week. This is two, two T. And then you say, you know what, perhaps this is rho YT minus one plus my error. So what I'm doing here, I'm adding this one here. This one, this model here is called autoregressive uh, lag model. Okay, so perhaps your model is not capturing, your, your errors are autocorrelated because you haven't captured the dynamics correctly. So capturing the dynamics implies that you need to use lags of your exogenous regressors of your X's or lags of your Y's. Okay. Now, extreme careful here. You need to be extremely careful here, guys, for the following reason. Okay. And, and, and this is a mistake that the people do frequently. Okay, careful. Okay, doing the doing just adding one lag is is, is a piece of cake. You want to see in in EVUs. It's extremely simple to add one piece of a uh, one lag of variables. The issue, guys, is that if you add one lag, okay, and then the, you don't solve the problem of autocorrelation, your results are going to be biased and not efficient. So the worst case scenario in econometrics is gonna happen because you added something that was wrong. Okay? Let me show you this in, in a very, very quick way. So let's assume guys that my model, I will simplify my model, is beta zero plus beta one x one t and, and see here simply I do this one. Here. Okay, so this is my, my model. What I've done is I added y t minus one. Okay, and assume guys that when you added this one here, even if you have added this one here, you still have autocorrelation of order one, for example. You still have ET equals rho ET minus one plus PT. So see, even though you included this one here to solve the problem, you know what, you forgot to check and then you still have the, the autocorrelation problem. Now see what happens. What I will do is I will call this one, we we'll call this two. What I will do is I will do two in one. So if I do two in one, I have yt equals beta zero plus beta one x one t 
plus rho y t minus one plus, uh, so let, let's call this gamma, okay? Just to differentiate. So let's call this gamma plus gamma e t minus one plus e t, okay? So let's call this three. And then what I will do is I will lag uh, number one. So lagging implies this is going to be y t minus one. I'm lagging this one equals beta zero plus beta one x one t minus one plus rho y t minus two plus e t minus one. Do you see what I've done? Okay, then copy, then I, I need to explain you this, so. Ready? Okay, just follow me, guys. Let's take a look before. Follow me because this is an explanation. Do you see that y t minus one has as a regressor e t minus one? Agree? And then you can see here in this model here, guys, that y t minus one is, is a regressor, do you agree? It's like an x in the model. And this x is interacting with e t. Remember there is a condition from these ones here, the covariance of the errors with the excess should be equal to what? Guys, this should be equal to what? Zero. Okay, this is what is called the orthogonality condition. But in this case, is this true? The covariance, of course, in my case, xi, xj, sorry, is what is called the uh, y t minus one. Okay, because this is also an x in this in this example here. Do you see that this is not satisfied in this example? Take a look. Y t minus one and e t minus one are regressors in this one in this equation number three. However, y t minus one depends on the errors t minus one. So they are correlated. You see that there is a covariance between them. So if there is a covariance between them, this one here is not satisfied. And guys, if orthogonality is not satisfied, okay? If not satisfied, our results are going to be biased and non-efficient. So this implies that we get whatever. Got it? So the, the solution is very simple. If you include yt minus one, you need to do again the test of the Durbin Watson and do the Bruce Gottfried again. Make sense to you? If you do this type of uh, dynamics in your model, please do it again. Do the Durbin Watson again, check that Durbin Watson again, and check the, the Bruce Gottfried, the Bruce Gottfried again. Okay. And then if you see that there is no issues there, so you are happy, you're, you can continue with your model. Your model is correct. Make sense to everyone? Okay. 
So as usual, what is the problem with auto, uh, autocorrelation? So you need to understand what, what happens with autocorrelation. As with the case with heteroscelasticity, guys, you know, the parameters are still unbiased. This is good. Okay, so no matter. So the, the parameters are going to be correctly esti est estimated. So they're not going to change. What is going to change is what? The model is not efficient. So this implies it will have large variance. Okay, and remember guys, as before, what is gonna happen is that the standard errors of my regressors or, or the errors is going to increase if, so let's say, if positive autocorrelation, this one here is going to increase compared to a, to a normal one. If this one increases, guys, for example, remember the, the, standard, uh, the standard error of alpha was equal to sum of x i squared minus x bar squared divided by s e of this one here. So what happens if this increases, this part here increases. So what happens here with all this one here? This all decreases, correct? Now, remember guys that we use the standard error of alpha in the t-test. And my t-test is simply a divided by the standard error of alpha. So what happens when this guy goes down? All this part goes up. Make sense to everyone? And so this implies, guys, that inferential statistics gets complicated. Okay, well, what I mean gets complicated is the following. If you are very close to the, to the, to the critical values, then you need to be very careful. But if your p-value is really far away from the critical values, you know, it is 30%. Okay, come on. You, the, the likelihood that you're going to have an impact here is very, very, very mild. But if you're very close to the 5%, then you have issues, okay, that you need to solve. How to solve? Well, as I mentioned to you guys before, consider seasonality. Look for omitted variables. You know, look for a correct dynamic of the model. What we have been discussing before. Or what the people use normally, guys, use and heteroscedasticity is going, to, it's going to be very long. An autocorrelation robust, consistent, yeah. consistent standard errors. Okay, so what, and, and this one here is called the new West. So this one here, guys, is what you try to do is you try to adjust only your standard errors. Okay, if you modify your standard errors in such a way that your T test or your chi squared, chi squared test or F test are going to be correctly specified and, and estimated. Okay, we're going to do this in one minute. OK. 
Okay, so let me share my e-views again. And let's go again, guys, to estimate your equation, the regular equation. So this is my regular equation. You remember we said, according to the, to the Bruce growth rate that we have autocorrelation of order five, do you agree? So we need to do something, right? And the way we are going to solve that one here is using the new we West, okay? What I will do is I will, I will use my, um, I think I can create a normal one. So let me estimate this one. Let me copy the variables just to show you what's going on. And I will create another regression. So it's quick uh, estimate equation. Let's copy all this one here. So I'm creating a, 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 new, a new equation. So you go quick estimate equation, and then you do the specification as I've done here. And then what, before going into the, into estimate this one here, you go options, and here you go the new West, heteroscasticity and autocorrelation consistent standard errors, new West. Okay. No, not that big. New West. Is everyone with me? And then you simply click OK. And I want this to be compared with this one here. So this one here is without uh, the, the new West. And this one here is with the new West. Okay, take a look. The coefficients are still unbiased, meaning that they don't change at all. If you just go to the, to the decimals, they are exactly the same. You see that? The coefficients don't change at all. What changes is the standard error. Uh, well, in this case, we have almost no change because uh, we, we were very close to the critical value, guys. Okay, but in general, it changes. Okay, here we don't see that because indeed we have almost no autocorrelation, so we were in the limit. Oh, sorry, 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 wait a second. So this one here is also with uh, the new West. So let me put this one as an ordinary. Oh yeah, here we go, here we go. This is my ordinary, this is my new West. Okay, perfect. You see this one? This one here is without the new West. This one here is with new West. Take a look to the to the coefficients. They don't change, but what they change is um, the standard errors. This was this was forty eight twelve. This now is forty one eighty. This was fifty five zero point fifty five. Now is zero point fifty nine. So that's what happens when you have autocorrelation. The coefficients are still unbiased, but you have uh, they are not going to be efficient anymore. So this means that the that the variability is going to change. Got it? So what do you do? You go to the new reverse and then you adjust your standard errors. And then these statistics are going to be much robust. Do you have questions, guys? Yes, Professor, can I see the formula you inputted in the specification? Yes, of course. So you go here. So the model is the same. And then if you want to do the, the new request, you go to options in, a, in this window, options. You go to the covariance method, just select there the, the, the new West. Uh, in the specification section, mine is blank and I'm just. Oh, this one? Yes. Oh, yeah, it is uh, the same. So, what I've done is I've copied, you have this one here, right? Just go here. Oh, sorry, I need to cancel this one. Just go here to the model that we have that is called MDV. Just copy all this part here. Okay, and then you go here. And then the, the variables are Rx on minus ATV, close parenthesis, constant RDGA, IA minus ATV, RCPI, RPCE, and COI. Sorry, Professor, at this stage, are we not looking at the um, significance level of the, the different? Um... No, 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 no. Yes, I, I, will, I will come back to, to there in a minute. Yes, no, what I'm doing is I'm simply checking 
uh, well, uh, the means are the errors, sorry, the, the sum of the errors is equal to zero. There is no heteroscedasticity. If there is, I correct. There is no autocorrelation of order five, order one, etc. Then I correct. Then I will I will arrive to the to the coefficients because before going to individual coefficients, I need to be sure that I satisfy everything first. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, guys. So we have tested heteroscedasticity autocorrelation, and now we need to go into the, the next assumption in the model that is. Normality. So remember, uh, I don't know what which assumption is this one here, but the normal assumption of the OLS model, I think is five, please. I know if it's five or four. The other assumption is that the errors are distributed as a normal degree, zero comma sigma square. Or this is the univariate model. And in the multivariate model, this is zero comma I sigma. So this is my variance covariance matrix. And what this implies is that simply only the diagonal elements are, so this implies the following. So it will have here sigma squared, zero, 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 you know, sigma squared, zero, 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 sigma squared, zero, if I have four variables, no? So this is this notation here, okay? So what I'm saying is that all my main diagonal are constant. It's exactly the same variance. Okay, and what we're going to test here is normality, guys. And for normality, what we need to remember is that the three moments of the normal distribution. So do you remember the skewness, okay? So the skewness, guys, is simply the expected value of the errors cube divided by the, the standard deviation cube. This is the skewness. And the normal distribution, the skewness is zero. So because remember, why is zero? Because the distribution is symmetric. You remember that? So it was 50% here and 50% here. So it is symmetric. So that's why the skewness in the normal distribution is going to be equal to zero. If the skewness is different from zero, so this implies that you don't have a normal distribution, correct? Now, what is the other measure that we're going to be taking a look at it is the kurtosis. The kurtosis is simply the fourth moment. So it's the expected value of the errors to the power four divided by the standard error, the standard deviation to the power four. And in a normal distribution, guys, this number is equal to three, okay? Remember that kurtosis measures the, the, the tails. Okay, so if you have a, a tail that is larger than, than three, for example, a T distribution, so this implies that you have fatter tails. Okay, so my test is going to be, is called the Harkerera. This is my test, test for normality. My null hypothesis is going to be, uh, my errors are normally distributed. And my test is going to be simply that Harkerera is equal to T that multiplies, <clears throat> let's call this one here moment three, and let's call this one here moment four. So it's going to be moment three squared divided by six <clears throat> plus moment four minus three squared divided by 24. And this is going to be distributed as a chi square with two degrees of freedom. Okay, you don't need to memorize that, that this one's here, but you need to remember what is the Harkevera. Oh, it's normality. And then I will show you, <coughs> I will show you in, in EVUS how, how this works. I remember this because I'm, I work with this all the time. So, but you don't need to remember, remember the logic, okay? So what I want is this number. If this number is going to be zero, so this, this is very close to zero, do you agree? And if this number here is, is close to three, if the kurtosis of the data is very close to three, so all this part is going to be zero, correct? Then if this is very close to zero in the extreme is zero, so this implies that we have normality, correct, guys? So this is going to be very small number if we are indeed in the normal case, correct? If 
can copy and then we, we go into. Sorry, Professor, can you explain what's inside that um, big bracket? Yes, it's moment three. So moment three is this one here. It's the expected value of the errors cube divided by the standard error cube. And M4 is uh, the fourth moment, is expected value of the errors, so the power four, divided by the standard error power four. Okay, and remember, what we are trying to do is we're trying to compare your data with a normal distribution, you agree? As I told you, the, the third moment, or the skewness in the normal distribution is zero. So if you have the data is close to zero, the moment, the moment three is close to zero, so all this number part, all this part here is going to be close to zero, agree with me, guys? Agree with me or not? Yes, it's the same. What I'm using here, M4 minus three, because I know that the normal distribution, the kurtosis of the normal distribution is equal to three. So if I have a number, that in my data has a fourth moment that is very close to three. So all this part here is going to be also close to three. And, and sorry, close to zero, three minus three is zero. And if this is normal indeed, this is going to be zero and this is going to be zero. So this is going to be a very small number. Correct. So the smaller this number, the more you know, more uh, confident you're going to be that you have a normal distribution. Correct. Okay. So let's go into eviews. So let's let's run. Okay. So we'll close the one that has. I will use the one that has the the the, the new west. Okay. Because this is correct. So I corrected by autocorrelation of order five. What I will do now, guys, is I, I try to see if it's if the if the errors are normal. So you go here, view, residual diagnosis. Histogram normality test. So what I'm trying to see is if are my errors normally distributed, yes or no. So just click in here and here are the results. So this is my heart carrier, 22. So you, you know, if you want to compare this one, you need to use a chi-square of two degrees of freedom, but you don't need that. You need simply this one here. So the, the probability is the p-value. So my question for you, you need to remember the following. What is the null hypothesis, guys? What is my null hypothesis of the heart carrier, Jack carrier? That the errors are normally distributed. Exactly. So at a 5% significance level, what do you can tell me about this, this hypothesis? Do you reject or fail to reject? Reject. Reject the null hypothesis because the p-value guys is very small. So this 0 0.000011 is smaller than 0 0.05. So I reject my null hypothesis. What I'm rejecting is what? that my, my errors are not normally distributed. Make sense? Yes. Yep, yeah, you understand? Perfect. Okay, so then we, are, we have an issue. What's the problem then? So let's, let's go back to my, let's go back to here. So what happens if no normality? are not normally distributed. Well, the issue is very simple to solve, guys. Because remember, if you have N is large, remember guys, if N is enough, it's very large, by the central limit theorem, the mean is going to be normally distributed by construction. Do you agree? So indeed, guys, if you if your sample size is large enough, you don't care about this assumption. You, you know, 
because by the central limit theorem, guys, all your t test, your chi square, your f test, etc., are going to be consistent and robust. However, okay. However, this non-normality can give you a, a hint about the potential problem that you can you can solve. Okay, and we're going to discuss this in, in one second. Do you have questions up to now? So if your uh, n is sufficiently large, it doesn't matter if no. the errors are not normally distributed? Exactly. It doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. However, it gives you, uh, you, know, you know what? You can use this fact for analyzing something. I will tell you in a minute what is this something. Okay. So in general, you don't have issues. You don't have issues, but uh, you can have some potential problem that you can solve. Okay, guys, sorry. So let's let's go and and let's take a look to can you please open another 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 e-views? The name of the e-views is Outliers Dummy. I, I, sent, I think I sent you this file just today. Uh, let me show, let me share my screen one second. So the name of the, of the file, guys, is Outliers Dummy. Do you have it? Yep. 30 seconds for everyone taking a look to that. Okay. So, you know, what I've done is this, is this graph. Remember, you need to know how to graph. You simply click on X and Y at the same time, right click, open as a group, and then you simply create a graph, okay? So this is a graph of X and Y, guys. You see that? You see my data? What, what is obvious in this data? What, what calls your attention in this data? Um, there's a negative correlation between X and Y. Yes, there is a negative correlation between X and Y. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, there's an outlier. Yeah, there is a, a dot that goes, you know, far away from the from the norm. You see that? All these guys are around this part here, negative correlative, and then there is this guy that is very far away. Okay, so this implies that, huh? You know what? Perhaps I have some issues here. And let's take a look to what happens if you simply decide to run the regression. Okay, so the the common uh, the common regression. So I will run. If you go quick estimated questions, just simply run Y, C, and X. This is your result. You see, take a look to the R square. Yeah, my, my X is negative, that's okay. And my constant is 3.59. Hmm. You, you don't see a lot here. You see that the domain Watson appears to be, yeah, perhaps I have some issues of positive correlation here. Have, I'm not so sure. But take a look to the F statistic, guys. What is the, the null hypothesis of the F statistic? The ANOVA test, what is the, the null hypothesis? That there's no linear relationship. Exactly. So, what can you tell me about uh, the five percent significance level about this regression? Do you reject or fail to reject? Guys, come on. Reject. Repeat. Yeah, you fail to reject because this number zero point sixty six is much larger than zero point zero five. So you fail to reject the null hypothesis. So this implies that the linear model for this one here, Servos, 
Okay. Now let me let me use this one here to to show you something that is, is really interesting here. Okay. What I will do is, you know, I want to fit the data in my graph. Okay. I want to do a kind of a forecast using my model. What is that? The values of my what are my fitted values? What I will do is follow me, guys. Just go forecast. And immediately it's going to appear a YF, so it means Y forecasted, okay? And then you simply run one to some, one to seven is my forecast, just click okay. And will appear a variable that is called YF. If you do that- I'm sorry, Professor, appear, can you- Yes, go back. You go yes. forecast. And then appears a variable. You you can name it as you want, but I, I name it yf as uh, default yf. All right. And then I simply forecast one to seven. So what I'm doing is, guys, simply saying, oh, I want to see according to my model what are going to be the values of y. Makes sense. That's what I'm doing. Okay. So I simply click OK, and then yf is going to appear. So it's going to appear something like that. Now, I want to see both together. I want to see the forecast with the real data. So you just click, uh, what is my Y, 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 Y? So, oh, here, Y and YF open as a group. And then you can plot. Okay, then you go view, uh, graph, scatter. Uh, what is my scatter here? Scatter here, and then you go here. Oh, sorry, it's not a scatter. This view graph is XY. I think it's XY line. Yeah, let's take a look to this one here. Yeah, this is not what I want. So I want graph. Let me see. So I have Maybe y and a dot plot. Yeah, it's dot plot. Completely right. So what is my dot plot? Oh, here we go. Yes, here we go. You see? Y is the blue one. Uh, we'll make this big. Yes, you see the blue ones? Are, are my Y, my original Y. And my YF is my forecasted Y. Um, give me one second, guys. No, this is another one. This is another one. This I'm using a completely different stuff. So let me let me run this one again for you because I need to be sure that I have this one. Uh, yf not um. Oh yeah, what I call this one is yf not um. Indeed. So what I need to do is I want to graph this one with yf not not um. I will open as a group. Then do the graph, uh, plot, plot, and take a look. You see, this is my feed. Have you have you tried that? How do you feel about this feed? Not so good, right? Because the data is like that, and then because of this guy. And remember, we are. When we talk about econometrics, guys, we always talk about the conditional mean. So we're talking about means. And what is the problem with the mean that we did in the, in the SATS part of the class? They are very susceptible. They are, they are influenced greatly by outliers. So a single point can modify you complete, completely your, your, your results. And by a single outlier, guys, all your, all your parameters are going to be biased and not efficient. So this is the worst case scenario also. Make sense to you? So that's why the non-normality gives you an idea of what's going on. So let me move this one here. And yeah. So let me do, let me estimate this one here again. If you go here, view, actual fitted residual, and take a look to the um, to this graph here. Now perhaps I can do my residual graph. You see, my, my residual graph is, you know, it is moving around this one here, and then suddenly jumps into, into a different space. When you have these jumps in residuals, this implies that there is something that the model is not able to capture. Okay. And sometimes it's referred to an outlier. So, how do we solve for the outliers, guys? Well, 
We solve for outliers using something that is called a dummy variable. Do you remember that? Have you done that? So I will do some introductions about dummy variables. And the dummy variables are going to be useful for tons of things. Recording in progress. Okay, so dummy variables. So what is a dummy variable, guys? Let's assume that I have the following specification. I have yt equals beta zero plus beta one x one t plus my error. Okay, so a very simple uh, univariate model, like the one that we have now. What we are going to do, guys, is we're going to define a dummy variable. So we're going to modify my model in the following way. I will say yt equals beta zero plus beta one x one t plus beta two d, I will explain what is d, plus my error. So, and d is going to be a, a, a variable is going to be one, you know, at point, you know, uh, where outlier is. and zero otherwise. Got it? So what I'm doing is I'm including one variable that is going to be basically, guys, it's going to be zero, 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 one. When it satisfies the condition, then it continues being zero. So this is my, my D. What is interesting, guys, is the following. What happens with your model here? Okay, once you estimate the model, <clears throat> Once you estimate the model, guys, what happens is the following. When you have d equals zero, so this implies that we are not considering the dummy. So what is going to be my, my model? My model is going to be yt equals beta zero plus beta one x one t. Do you agree, guys? Because if d is zero, this part disappears. Make sense? Guys, follow me. Make sense? When D is zero, so this implies that I'm not talking about the outlier, my model goes back to the normal model. And what happens if D equals one? So my model is going to be equal to beta zero plus beta one X one T plus beta two. Do you agree with me or not? Because E, eh, sorry, D is going to be equal to one. So beta two times one. And then what is interesting guys, these two are constants. If these two ones are constants, indeed my model, what I'm doing is my, I'm changing my intercept. Do you see? Okay. So let's take a look to what happens in, in our case. Copy this one here. Let's see what happens in, in, in EVUs. But that's what we're doing. We're giving, we're, we're basically removing the outlier from, the, from my data set. So I'm running my regression only with my data that is not my, my outlier. I compute my, my line and then I include a dummy. All right? You're gonna see how beautiful this works in, in, in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Okay, so let's let's take a look to EVUs. Yeah, can we move you here? Now, guys, what I will do is I will create a dummy variable. Okay, how do we create a dummy variable? Okay, we go here. Well, two ways. You know what? The, the, the method that I really like the most is do this in Excel. And once I have done this in Excel, because it's much simpler, then I simply import this data, this variable into my, my EVUs. Okay. But this one here is easy because it's a, it's a it's only one dummy. But let's generate 
I will, you have it already created. So let's call this D2, okay? The D2 is going to be equal to D1. And this one here is going to be equal to zero. So what EBUS does, guys, is simply takes a, take a look to how many observations do we have. I have seven. So if you do D2 equals zero, it will create a, a vector of seven zeros. Okay, so if you do this, enter, take a look to D2. You see, it has zero, 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 zero. Then let's take a look to my Y. My Y, my, my, yeah, sorry, it's not, uh, yeah. Let's take a look to X and let's take a look to my X, Y graph. So this point is four, four. Yeah, it's more or less four, four with five. Yeah, so my outlier is, is the last position, do you agree guys? So what I need to do is I, I'm here with a, the variable that I created, just click edit, go to the point that you want, just click enter, one, and that's it. You have created your, your dummy. Wait, Professor, so, quickly, where is edit again? Oh, in here. Oh, okay, thank you. In here, okay. And then you simply close this one here and then you have your, your, your D2, you see that? Okay, done, great. Perfect, fantastic. Now, what we do now is I will create my, my equation now. It's going to be the following. It's going to be Y, C, X, and D1. So what I've done is simply what I, what I did in the, in the whiteboard, remember? I have my X and I include one additional variable that I call in this case D1. And then you simply run your OLS model and take a look to the difference between these two models. So let me estimate this one. This one here is without the dummy, and this one here is with the dummy. Take a look to the dramatic changes, guys. Take a look to the R square. Before it was 0 0.03, 0 0.04. Now my R square is 0 0.98. Take a look to my F statistic. Remember the probability of, um, of my F test is now is, before it was 0 0.66. So it was linear model is not good. Linear model is beautiful. The Durbin Watson, I have autocorrelation. I don't have autocorrelation for one. Here I should have, I potentially could have a autocorrelation, positive autocorrelation. Make sense to you? A single variable, a single additional variable, guys, changes dramatically everything. Right? So this implies two things. How do I detect that? Remember, normality was telling to you sometimes the normality is not satisfied. And then you say, oh, come on, I, I don't care because I have the central limit theorem. By central limit theorem, really this assumption is not very, very strong. However, it can give you a hint. You know, hey guys, be careful. Do you have outliers? And if you have outliers, you need to solve that because it improves dramatically the models, okay? In finance, we have a lot of outliers, guys. For example, we have October 1987. We have the, the flash crash on May 6th, I think it was 2011 or something like that the first class that was a collapse. So we have, we know, if you know the data, you are going to identify, oh, I know this one, what happened here, what happened here, what happened here. So it's much better for you to control for this type of variables. Yeah, dummy variables, it's very simple. Okay. Now guys, let's take a look to the, to the forecast. If you do forecast, yeah, let's call this YF. Okay, when you click okay, it's gonna create this YF. And then you can take a look to the YF uh, where's my graph? Graph feed with dummy. And take a look to graph feed, no dummy. Take a look, guys. This was the, the feed without the dummy. Terrible. You see that? Really terrible. Agree with me or not, guys? Take a look to what happens with my feed now that I have included a single dummy. Beautiful. And my, my forecast about the dummy is perfect because oh, correctly. Make sense to you guys? Uh, professor, I have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. So in this scenario, it's pretty obvious what the anomaly is. Yes. Um, moving forward, is there a way to like mathematically determine whether to something's an anomaly or not or is yes. it usually just by looking at it no no no, no. normally the, the well 
there are tons of definitions of what you define as an outlier, but the people argue that if you are far away from two standard deviations or, or three standard deviations, everything above or below three standard deviations can be considered as an outlier. Okay, thank you. Okay. Make sense? Okay, guys. Okay, let's continue. So let me go back here. So we have discussed uh, dummy variables, and I will I will go back to dummy variables more and more later. Okay, with an example. This is a challenge for you. Um, yes. Okay. So let's go into a, into a new problem. Something is called multicollinearity. Okay, so what is multicollinearity, guys? Do you remember how was the my my b was simply equal to x prime x to the minus one x prime y? Do you remember that we did this mathematics before? And I, I created a video for you, so you need to take a look to that. You don't need to memorize, but this is the formula for, for finding the coefficients b. What is interesting, guys, is that this one here has an inverse. Okay, and how do you find the inverse? It's simply going to be the adjunct of x prime x divided by the determinant of x prime x. And so this is the formula of the inverse. What is interesting, guys, is that in order for this number to, to exist, how the determinant should be? This should be different from zero. Do you agree? Because if this determinant is zero, so any number divided by zero, any matrix divided by zero is un undefined. Correct. So in order to find, in order to have the inverse of a matrix, the determinant must be different from zero. So how do we call those matrices that have a determinant that different from zero are called non-singular matrices? Okay, non-singularity simply means that you have the determinant is different from zero. So this implies that uh, the inverse exists. That's all. Now, I will give you one example, guys, of perfect multicollinearity. And you wanna see what is the issue. Take a look to the following example. 3x plus 2y equals 5, and 6x plus 4y equals 10. Can you solve this equation? System of equations, remember this system of equations? Can you solve that one minute? Uh, no, you can't. Why not? Um, because if you try to solve it, you'll get you'll get zero is equal to zero. It's an unsolvable yeah. system. Exactly. And and how do you know that is, is the following the following way? So remember, if I try to solve this in a matrix way, this is the the, the matrix way of solving this one here. You can see from here, guys, is that this one here, this one here is simply two times column one, uh, row one. Yes or no? So you just multiply this by two, two times three is six, two times two is four, five times two is 10. So indeed what you have here, guys, is that you have linear dependence. Okay. Professor, I think that that should be infinite solutions. Right? Yes, undefined yeah. solutions. It's, it's yeah. called undefined. It's not that it doesn't exist, it is undefined. So you can have millions of solutions. Yes. Right? So the, the, unique, the unique condition is not satisfied. U uniqueness condition is not satisfied. Correct. Okay. So linear dependence implies, guys, that you have here, in, you don't have two equations, two unknowns. You have one equation, two unknowns. You agree? Basically, solution is undefined. So this is the issue, guys. And, and take a look to, to this one here. Can you compute the determinant of this? Let's call this A. Can you find the determinant of A? 
what is going to be? It's going to be, remember, three times four minus six times two. Okay, it's just you don't need to remember this stuff, but this is equal to zero. So what happens when the determinant of A equals zero? What happens with A minus one? Because the solution of this system, guys, indeed is equal to xy equals three, two, six, four to the minus one that multiplies five, 10. So I need to do an inverse. So what happens if the determinant of A equals zero? The determinant of this one here is undefined. All right? So basically you cannot find a single solution. And so that's the issue of perfect multiple linearity. Okay? So if we have perfect multiple linearity, guys, don't worry. EVUs or Excel or MATLAB or anything is gonna tell you, you know what, near singular matrix. So you cannot solve the system. All right? Now, the issue is not perfect multicollinearity because the solution is very simple. You, you, you say, you know what, I need to remove one variable, but if I have a, I need this variable, I need to find another variable. The issue is quasi multicollinearity. So what is quasi multicollinearity? Of course, it's not perfect multicollinearity, but you have that the interaction between the, the, the excess is very strong. The correlation between the x's is very strong, all right? And then this can affect your, your, your results, your, your, your results. The results are even in the presence of multicollinearity, guys, are going to stay unbiased. So parameters are still unbiased. So no issue with that. However, they are going to be non-efficient. So remember guys, non-efficient means that the standard errors are larger or smaller, they are not correct. So non-efficient means simply that inferential statistics is not possible. Inferential statistics is not, is not going to be potentially correct, right? Now, what do we do in order to solve quasi multicollinearity? Remember quasi multicollinearity means simply that the EXs are related. Okay, so some solutions, if possible, just get rid of one of them, correct? So this implies if you have two variables that are very correlated, just remove one because the information that one of them provides to the system is nothing because they are correlated with the other one. The other one, guys, your solution is use ratios. Because remember, a ratio is one variable over all variable, so you create one variable. So you eliminate one by creating a ratio. Agree with me? The other solution, guys, is normally increase the frequency of the, of the observations. For example, if you, have, if you have quarterly data, move to monthly. Normally it helps. Now, this is theory because sometimes you don't have a, for example, if you work with macro data in, in my time, quarterly data was the, the, the highest frequency, the lowest frequency. Monthly was almost impossible. Now you can find monthly data, right? And now how do you, how do you see issues with multicollinearity? You know, it, it is very interesting guys you're gonna see extremely high R squares, okay? 98%, something like that. But then no significance of individual coefficients. That, that, saying, that sounds weird, right? Having a very strong R square and then the coefficients, individual coefficients are not significant. So meaning what? Every single row of my data is not making sense in my regression. It doesn't make sense. And the last one is uh, large confidence intervals. So this means basically, guys, that you cannot do inferential statistics. Okay, sorry, there is another solution here, fourth solution. 
It's just a different model. Normally, PCA models, rich regression models, are prepared for for this type of uh, for this type of data. So they use that correlation present between X and X and Xs. So PCA is principal component analysis, and rich regression is simply another model uh, works with auto multiple linearity. Okay. Okay, guys, I, we are going to stop here. I need to talk about, uh, I, I have sent to you a couple of challenges. So let me, let me see the challenges. So this is something that you need to start working. Um, challenge one, guys, you have done that already. So you just need to find new data sets and then work on that. It's uh, the CAPE model. So you need to do that. It's very simple. Challenge number two, uh, let me, let me open, uh, let me open. Let me show you one second. Challenge two. No, 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 sorry, sorry. I need to show you my Excel. So, okay, guys. So challenge number two is this one here. It looks, looks very simple. So we have data. So this is uh, the, the tolls. Tolls, uh, you, you know, when you go in a, in, a, in a highway and then you simply cross a toll and then you simply pay tolls. Okay. So this is data from monthly data, year one, three years of data. And what is interesting, guys, is what I, I want you to analyze is the following. So the, the challenge is the following. So I want simply the, the, the amount and I have the, the US dollars, okay? So if I simply take a look to these ones here, I will move them just to show you what, what I want from you. Oh. I just want to copy this one here. I will put the amount here. Oh. And then I just want you to, to take a look to this one here. Okay, so graph X and Y. X is going to be time simply, and Y is simply the, the, the revenues. Just take a look to what happens in here. And the question is going to be very simple. This is my data, do you see that? My question for you and the challenge for you is simply guys, tell me more or less what is gonna be the, uh, the revenues in periods 42, 43, 45, for the, the next, the, the next uh, four months. That's what I want. Do you see that? So these are months. This is my data, then my revenues. So just to give you some history here, this was 2000, uh, I, I don't remember, I think it was 2010. There was a change of policies. You know, I think that uh, the toll prices increased more, more is almost 50%. So, and what happened is that the people, instead of using the, the, the main highways, they simply start moving towards a, a, a parallel road and then came back after the toll. So they start avoiding the toll, right? So this was, this was a policy change here. Now, this D1, guys, can help you. This is a dummy variable, okay? So you can see, I put one when it belongs to year one, revenues of year one and zero otherwise, and try to see how this can help you, okay? So the challenge is the following. You have this data. The challenge for you is simply tell me what is going to be the expected revenues for, the, for months 37, 38, from 37 to 40. So I want to, you to tell me what is going to be these values using the simple OLS model. Okay, guys, so that's your challenge. The, the first challenge is the OLS, the, the CAPE model, so you can, you, you're going to be able to do that. Uh, just in case I gave you already the EBUS file, with this data, so you need to do that. Just think how you can use the dummy variables, etc. You can you can take a look to uh, online or whatever. You can uh, you can work together, etc. Make sense? Okay. Now, guys, uh, there is something a little missing piece of the equation for uh, for the OLS model. I think that in twenty minutes I can do that, but I cannot do this today. So the exam, the second quiz, is going to be on the on the week of the twenty. Okay, 
So we, we need to run. Now, how the dynamic is going to be? I will prepare for you guys uh, by Thursday or Friday, you're going to have, because we are almost, almost there. So you, by Thursday or Friday, guys, you're going to have a video, okay, where I will present uh, the, the univariate uh, time series model. You need to please watch that. It's more or less going to be a kind of one hour. Watch that, analyze the details, understand the details, because next class, we're gonna we're going to work with a univariate time series. Got it. The twentieth is going to be your second quiz. So and uh, da, 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 I think I, I will prepare another video for you on the on the math side of the question, guys. When I do the math, you know all the math just to explain to you guys. This is the way it works, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I will do videos. I will post this to you. You need to to invest one hour of your life on just analyzing this one here. When I start next class, I will finish uh, all these assumptions and I will invest 15 minutes on uh, you know, answering your questions about the model, the, the mathematics side that you have seen. And then I jump into, into EVMs immediately, got it? You need to, to review that, please, okay? You need to review. The math is very simple. The intuition is fundamental for you. So I need you to read. I, I will prepare this video for you in, a, you know, in, the, next, in the next couple of days. Okay, guys, questions? Sorry, uh, professor. professor, can I have a word with you after class? Yes, very quickly uh, because I'm, I'm rushing also. Yes. You said yes, there please. was going to be a quiz on the 13th, so it's the 20th. Yeah, it, it is is moved to the 20th. Yes. Okay. I, I prefer no to, I prefer to, you know, the 13th, guys, we are going to move towards a time series. So we're going to start immediately time series. Okay. So okay. first first 15 minutes, we finish this model, then we go time series. And I believe that 13, I will be almost done with time, with universal time series. The 20 is going to be the gash, 27 is going to be VAR, and the fourth is going to be breaking one. So that's that's good. So we are, but we are just just in time. Okay. Uh, professor, so, do you so want the, us to do the two challenges for next class? Yes, the, the two challenges for next class. Okay. You can work together, okay. just share ideas and then you know, just try to, to understand how this works. Okay. Okay, guys. So perfect. the 20th is just the o, just OLS, that quiz. Just OLS, exactly okay. that. It's just OLS, uh, including the assumptions. So what I will do is, next class, I will give you a couple of minutes. I, I, I need to prepare the exam. But I will most likely present screenshots. And you need to remember, what is the test? How do I test for heteroscasticity? You know, OK, what the F test, what is the meaning of that? OK, what I do if I have heteroscasticity? So that's the things, guys, that, you need to really remember. Remember the final exam is, believe me or not, it's, a, it's an oral exam. In, in econometrics, we have an oral exam, but I, I prefer to do that because I, you know, the people fail dramatically and catastrophically when you have a knowledge. I, I want you to understand and remember all these things. Okay, okay, guys, we we'll stop here. I need to be jumping to my my oral class. I have a uh, Kevin I, I wait with you. Okay, guys, talk soon. See you later. Thank you much. Bye, yeah. guys. Take care. Thank you. Just gonna wait until all of them leave. Yes, Sorry, Karen. quick question. Yes, uh, uh, are we getting our quiz one grade back? Oh yeah, you know what? Uh, yeah, I forgot that. Yes, yeah, give me the other week, please, uh, Susan. I, I have them already. Send me an email, I can send you your grade. Okay, sounds good. Thank okay, you. perfect, Susan. Take care, bye-bye. Uh, Professor, can you do me a favor? What I'm about to discuss is kind of sensitive. And can you just do me a favor and remove the um, last person from the room very quickly, just due to federal regulations and all? Hey, Deepak, are you? Yeah, yeah he was, he's up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, um, just kind of um, uh, disability accommodation. So, when the 20th hit, I thought it was going to be next week. So, I mean, so I have doubling time. So when do you think I should start? And just kind oh, of- Oh, you, you start at three or something, like or four. You know, that's okay with me because if you start at four, you're gonna have more than enough time. I'm pretty sure about that. Okay, so let's, how about we, um, okay, let's start at four. And then another question I do have is, um, I know we're rushing on time here. It's just the, um, what's the test? What is that gonna look like? I mean, like, cause here's the thing, I mean- I don't know. So it's gonna look, you know what? Uh, you don't need to remember the formulas, but you need to remember every single test, hypothesis, uh, problems, solutions, etc. You need to, to know that. You know, and I will present- so you know, We're still recording. Yes, oh, ah. <laughs>